Kevin Pinkert, Director of the National Archives Experience, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth annual William G. McGowan Forum on Communication, Technology, and Government. Tonight's program really captures the spirit of this series, looking at the transformative effect of Web 2.0 on the relationship between citizens and their government. As the nation's records, records keeper, the National Archives has a special interest in these emerging technologies, not only in terms of transparency and civic participation, but also in thinking about the long-term preservation of this new class of government records, the potential for what our government can accomplish by tapping into the talents of the American people is tremendous. And so is the obligation to document these processes while respecting the privacy of individuals willing to contribute to the national good. At the end of tonight's panel discussion, we hope to reserve about 20 minutes for questions from the audience. I need to ask you to move to the microphones uh, because we are recording tonight's program and putting it on the web. Uh, and we want to make sure everyone can hear. I would also ask you to keep your question short. About the length of a tweet would be good uh, because we're going to try to get in as many questions as we can. The annual McGowan Forum is made possible by a public-private partnership with the Foundation for the National Archives and a grant from the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. Private support is key in allowing this agency to produce such a robust calendar of programs and exhibits. The Foundation is instrumental in keeping our name in front of the American people and in turning our records into educational tools, including, I might point out, underwriting for our Collaborate Web Forum as well as the future DocsTeach.org, a website that will not only provide new classroom tools, but a place to share the work product of those tools among teachers across the world. It's my honor tonight to ask Executive Director of the Foundation for the National Archives, Thoda Kolo, to offer greetings on behalf of the Foundation. Thank you, Marvin. Hello, and welcome to our magnificent, beautiful William G. McGowan Theater. Like Marvin said, I'm Thoda Kolo. I'm the executive director of the Foundation for the National Archives and an extremely proud partner of the National Archives experience. My very big thank you this evening. We are extremely grateful to the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund, many of whom are with us this evening, and I'd actually like to recognize them if they'd stand up for the incredibly great work that they do. Oh, you're waving. You don't want to stand up. OK, wave, everybody. But in any case, thank you all. <laughs> Their extremely and very generous support not only made this physical space possible, but they continue to be fabulous partners, offering ongoing support with additional grants, but more importantly, their friendship, and we are truly grateful. We are pleased that over the past few months, we've had programs here featuring some really spectacular personalities, from Ob Robert Osborne introducing Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, to Michael Beschloss describing finding a letter he wrote to President Kennedy, from Cokie Roberts and Drew Faust and David Grubin, to Helen Thomas offering really good advice to our presidents, as well as first ladies here, including Hillary Clinton and Barbara Bush. And these are just the tip of an iceberg of great programming here in the William G. McGowan Theater. So I am delighted to introduce our important partner, Su Ling Jin McGowan from Chicago, Illinois, is the founder of Flying Food Fair, Inc., an airline catering fresh um, meal production company serving international airlines and specialty retailers. I found out tonight she's supporting my heritage. I'm half Icelandic, and they also serve Icelandic air, so I'm excited about that. Uh, Sue has served as chairman and chief executive officer there since 1983. She's also the owner and founder of New Management LTD, a real estate sales, leasing, management, and development firm, and has served as its president since 1977. 
Sue Jin also serves as vice president of the Field Museum in Chicago, president and director of the Su Ling Jin Charitable Fund, and the president and director of the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. Sue, welcome to Washington, DC. Good evening. I'm Sue Jin McGowan, and I am pleased to welcome on behalf of the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund, which honors the memory of my late husband, Bill McGowan. Um, Bill passed away in 1992. Bill loved history. He loved movies. He loved debating the great ideas of the day. It was natural for the, for the McGowan Fund to work with the National Archives to ensure an ongoing national conversation about important topics. In 2003, the fund partnered with the archives to develop the William G. McGowan Theater here in Washington, DC, the center point of American democracy. Initially, we established the McGowan Forum on Communication, Technology, and Government. Enthused audiences gathered in quality dialogue generated by this fall series and inspired our board to establish a second series of public forums, Women in Leadership. That spring series focuses on women in business, government, journalism, academia, the arts, science, and medicine. Tonight's program, the fifth program in our fall series, deeply echoes Bill's great belief in the power of communication to keep democracy vibrant and responsive. That conviction fueled his career and ultimately led to enormous change in US and global communications. Bill earned his way through high school and college by working on the railroad in a small Pennsylvania town where his father was a railroad engineer. He set his sights on Harvard Business School because he wanted the best education possible. When his savings ran out, he funded his second year of his MBA via student aid, available to the top 5% of his class. That was part of his can-do spirit. Bill next became a consultant in the 1960s and recognized the potential of mass communication. He partnered with a small Midwestern company that provided telephone service between St. Louis and Chicago. That was the beginning of MCI. At the time, AT&T had a lock on all the local phone services in America. There was no competition. There was no progress. Bill knew this was wrong and destructive to the potential for America to advance in a field that he saw as the wave of the future. With MCI as his base, Bill waged legal and regulatory service battles against AT&T over a period of many years. Ultimately, MCI broke AT&T's virtual monopoly and opened telecommunications up to healthy competition. Following that, Bill led MCI and the industry championing new technologies and providing improved services at lower rates. One of our young McGowan scholars, whose college education we actually fund, had described Bill's uh, achievement as a spark, as the spark igniting the flame in our country's spirit. And the Hagley Museum and Library, not so far from here in Wilmington, Delaware, has written about Bill. More than any one individual, William McGowan brought about the breakup of AT&T and fundamentally changed the telecommunication revolution. Bill's story explains why this evening's topic, Web 2.0 Technologies and Participatory Democracy, is such a vital and important subject for the McGowan Fund. We thank the panel tonight for participating, and we look forward to hearing your ideas. And also, we thank the National Archives and its programming team for continuing to develop these provocative and informative programs. Thank you.
Thank you, Sue. Your support and the support of your board mean everything to us. Tonight's distinguished panel will be moderated by Dr. Daryl West. Dr. West is currently the Vice President and Director of Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. His specializations include mass media, public opinion, technology policy, electronic government, health IT, broadband, and mobile communications. I don't know how you put that all together. Um, Dr. West is the author of 16 books dealing with media technology and public policy making, including digital medicine, uh, healthcare, and the internet era, and digital government, technology, and public sector performance. His work on the, at the Brookings builds on his accomplishments as a scholar and lecturer, serving as the John Hazen White Professor of Political Science and Public Policy and Director of the Taubman Center for Public Policy at Brown University. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Darrell West. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Marvin. It is a pleasure to be here, and I want to also extend my thanks to Sue McGowan and the McGowan Charitable Fund for all the great work that you're doing. This is a spectacular theater. It's actually my first time seeing this theater, and it's really a wonderful sight. So thank you for all the great work that you are doing. It is a great time to be thinking about government 2.0 because the rise of information technology has created enormous opportunities to alter how government functions with online transactions, two-way communications, and collaboration through social media. There are opportunities to engage citizens and make government much more effective. It is possible to use technology to create a new kind of participatory democracy, and this involves a wide variety of different outlets uh, electronic comments on proposed federal rules, expert panels to evaluate new patents, websites for public information, and a wide variety of other things. And I think now, in particular, is an exciting time to be thinking about technology because of all the new things that are taking place at the level both of state and federal government. The Obama administration has placed a high priority on technology innovation. In fact, I have argued that President Obama uh, has the potential and hopefully will become our nation's first truly digital president. Uh, he certainly was very innovative in his use of technology in the campaign, and now he is trying to bring that same sense of innovation to the public sector with new policies on openness and transparency. The Federal Communications Commission is envisioning some uh, new uh, rules on net neutrality and extending uh, some of those uh, principles to the wireless uh, world. So I think it's really a terrific time to hold this panel given all the developments taking place in the technology area as well as some of the uh, new uh, possibilities that are being established at uh, the level of the uh, federal government. So to address this topic, we have assembled a distinguished panel of experts. Uh, Beth Simone Novak is the Deputy Chief Technology Officer for the uh, Office of Open Government uh, in the White House. She's also a professor of law at New York University. She is the author of Wiki Government, How Technology Can Make Government Better, Democracy Stronger, and Citizens More Powerful. And this is really an outstanding book on collaborative decision making in the public sector. And I say that not just because the book was published by Brookings Institution <laughs> Press, uh, but it really is a terrific book. Even if I had no connection with Brookings, I would uh, make uh, that statement. Uh, we're also fortunate to have Mark uh, Webbick, who's a visiting professor of law and executive director of the Center for Patent Innovations at the New York Law School. He served as general counsel and senior vice president of Red Hat Incorporated. He has written and spoken extensively on the subjects of open source software, software patents, and patent reform. He has published articles in the Duke Law and Technology Review, the Internet Law and Business uh, Publication, and the New South Wales Society for Computers and the Law. His article on understanding open source software has been reprinted around the world as a primer on open source uh, licensing. Gigi San is the president and co-founder of Public Knowledge. Uh, public Knowledge is a DC public interest advocacy organization dedicated to defending citizen rights in our emerging digital culture. She has been 
uh, frequently quote, quoted in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and uh, numerous other uh, publications. She has published articles in the Washington Post, Variety, CNET, and Legal Times, uh, among other outlets. She's appeared on numerous television and radio programs, including the Today Show, uh, McNeil Lair, the National Public Radio's All Things Considered, and Morning uh, Edition. She is a senior adjunct fellow at the Silicon Flatiron Center at the University of Colorado and a senior fellow at the University of Melbourne Faculty of Law in Australia. And our last uh, panelist is Jason uh, Barron, who is Director of Litigation for the National Archives and Records Administration. In that position, Jason is responsible for overseeing all litigation-related activities facing the National Archives, including litigation involving access, uh, access to federal and presidential records. He serves as NARA's representative to the Sedona Conference, where he is a member of the steering committee for the Working Group on Electronic Document Retention and Production. He is a founding coordinator of the Trek Legal Track and International Research Project organized through the National Institute of Standards and Technology to evaluate search protocols used in e-discovery. And he currently serves as an adjunct professor in the University of Maryland's Graduate College of Information Studies. So the format that we are going to follow tonight is we I will start with uh, questions for the panelists. Each of them will make uh, brief opening uh, statements. Then we'll have a period of panel discussion. And then, as Marvin uh, pointed out, there will be opportunities for each of you to ask uh, questions and make uh, comments uh, near the end of uh, the program. So I would like to start with uh, Beth. Uh, you literally are on the front lines of Web 2.0 and participatory democracy. So can you tell us uh, what the government is doing and how these activities are going to make the public sector function? more effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daryl. I've had the pleasure to be moderated by you before. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be with you and with our fellow panelists. And I want to also thank the organizers at NARA, to Marvin for his lovely introduction, and to Mrs. McGowan. It's really quite a pleasure to be here uh, of all places, really the home of transparency, if you will, and of openness in government. Um, so. I think what's exciting today about as we leap forward from the traditional vehicles and documents of our democracy that sit in the rotunda out here to now thinking about how do the new tools of Twitter and Facebook and Web 2.0 really change our democratic culture and the way that our government can function and does function, is that ultimately what these technologies allow us to do is to frankly bring down the costs of creating a participatory democracy. They help us if we have the vision and we have the will in which this administration does to eliminate the barriers for people to participate in their government, to allow people to reduce the influence and government to reduce the influence of lobbyists and special interests and create a government culture in which everyone has an opportunity to participate. I think we need the vision and the, and the commitment to do that, but in many ways we can't realize that vision without the tools that give us the mechanisms for new forms of engagement and participating. So just as in the same way we are seeing a transformation in the social and economic sector of the rise of what some people call amateur production, people creating their own movies and putting them on YouTube, people creating songs and putting them up on iTunes. I just had a conversation this morning with the uh, renowned MIT professor, Eric von Hippel, who tells me about a study that he's worked on in the UK that said that 8% of consumers have either created or modified the products that they use. How much more so should it be the case if what we are doing is making the t-shirts and making the songs that we should now have better mechanisms in which to participate in the life of our democracy and in the public sphere? So for me, Government 2.0 and this use of Web 2.0 to create new forms of institutions of government is really to realize uh, new institutions and new ways of working that allow us to engage in our democracy in new ways. And the question is, why does that matter and why should we care about it? Well, obviously, it helps us to build a robust public sphere and create a vibrant democracy and all those good things that we care about. But I think even more pragmatically, when we can increase the level of direct engagement that people have in their government, we can hold government more accountable for the work that it does. We can create a more critical eye on government, and I know that we're going to hear from some of the panel about some of the ability that we, uh, the, that, that accountability that we have to realize and talk about the ways that new technology can help us to do that. It also helps us, though, to scrutinize and analyze the way government spends money. 
So when we can use new technologies in order to help us visualize and see the way we spend money, we can reduce the costs in a quite literal sense. We can reduce the waste and bring down the size of government and save money for the American taxpayer by actually bringing that kind of accountability to government. And finally, engagement matters because it helps us to improve the quality of our everyday life. So it's not just a matter of creating institutions of government that work better, but helping people to live their lives better in more useful ways. So let me just give a couple of quick examples about what I think that that means, um, and, then, and then turn it over to the rest of the panel. So just in the area, for example, of accountability, when we use new Web 2.0 technologies now and take the Federal Register, which is published here by NARA, and make it available in a machine-readable format that allows other people to engage with it, like the Center for uh, Information Technology and Policy at Princeton, to build the first ever annotatable Federal Register that allows people to participate in and comment on this newspaper of our democracy. We create an opportunity to both scrutinize and hold government accountable and to do so through participatory mechanisms. We can actually realize greater cost savings when, in fact, we set up a website like recovery.gov or it.usaspending.gov or usaspending.gov that allow us to track how the money is being spent in government and how that money might be saved. When we use new brainstorming platforms, that allow us to do things like the Green Gov Challenge or the Save Award. <coughs> the Green Gov Challenge, you may have read today, that 5,300 new ideas were submitted and 165,000 votes were cast to generate innovative suggestions for how we green the government and make it work better and more effectively. Again, it's a transparency mechanism, but it doesn't work without participation that Web 2.0 enables for us to think about new ideas and new approaches to solving problems. And in turn, we, we can improve the quality of life for people when we do things, for example, like, as Marvin talked about, the Collaborate Forum here at NARA, in which what he's working on is bringing teachers together who are teaching using primary source materials. It makes them better teachers, more informed teachers. It helps them improve the quality of education in their classrooms because we're using tools that connect people in new ways. When last week, uh, HHS launches a forum on health IT, and allows professionals across the medical profession to connect with one another to talk about what the standards are by which we're going to build electronic healthcare record systems so that we can realize the dream of reduced cost for uh, electronic healthcare records and improved healthcare in America. We're using new technologies and we're using the spirit of participation to achieve national priorities around education, around healthcare around entrepreneurship and other goals, which we'll hear more about today. So let me just wrap up to say what do I think the lessons are for engagement? Uh, and where does this sort of take us, this idea that obviously if we have a spirit of transparency and a commitment to transparency and participation, and we have the tools that allow us to do this, and we can create greater accountability and better cost savings and improve the quality of life and achieve national priorities, what does this mean in terms of our administration position, philosophy, vision, and action? Well, it means we have to create as many opportunities as possible for people to engage and to participate. And whether it's thinking about the teachers who are engaging around primary source materials, or the coders and civically-minded geeks who are getting together to write electronic healthcare record systems, or the software developers who are taking the Federal Register that's released out of NARA and creating new products out of it, we have to create many new opportunities for participation. We have to understand that these opportunities for participation don't only look like writing a comment in response to an agency rule, though we have to do that well in addition. But it may involve things like writing, making a video to, to educate Americans about um, how to prevent the H1N1 flu virus which was something that HHS did when they launched a video competition on YouTube to create the best video for H1N1 prevention. It might look like making a software application. It might look like getting out and volunteering in a school to actually help realize the priority of science education in America. So it's proliferating opportunities for participation, creating innovations in the way that we think about participation. And finally, it has to be based on ultimately a vision and a policy that focuses on and believes in trusting the American people to collaborate with the government in developing solutions to the problems that we face today. 
So the tools are wonderful, and we have to have access to the tools and easy ways to get them, and the General Services Administration is helping to make sure that agencies who want tools can get access to them. But it has to start with a vision and a philosophy and a commitment to participatory democracy and to trust in and working with the American people to realize that vision. Thank you. Mark, you have the Center for Patent Innovations at NYU, so you've spent a lot of time thinking about the subject of innovation. How can we improve the patent process, and why is this important for innovation? Well, for, uh, thank you, Daryl. Uh, New York Law School, by the way, uh, where Beth, I, uh, Beth will hopefully be returning to the faculty soon, and I'm on the faculty. Um, I want to walk you through a little imagery, if I can. <clears throat> Think for a second. <clears throat> You're not in your current profession. You are, in fact, a software engineer. Now, I know that's going to stretch your imagination a little bit. If, <laughs> certainly, if you're me, it will. You're a software engineer, and you work for the patent office. You're a patent examiner. And you're charged in your duties by our government to evaluate applications pertaining to new inventions to determine whether, on behalf of all of us, the citizens of this country, you will grant a monopoly for the next 20 years on the invention that the party's claiming. Now, that's a human activity. And we're asking them to do this based on the information, the best information that we can give them. Well, the best information we can give them is actually quite good up to a point. They've got powerful search engines at their, uh, available to them. And they can search every patent database virtually in the world. So they can look at patents that were issued in Europe, in Japan, in, uh, with the World Intellectual Property Organization, and determine whether there is a patent out there that already embodies the, the invention that the applicant is claiming. But what if that pre-existing invention, that prior art, isn't embodied in an existing patent? Where did they look? Well, they do have access to a database of some non-patent literature, uh, documentation for software, technical manuals, journal articles, presentations that were made to a, a, a software society. But it's very limited. So if it's not embodied in a patent and it's not in that non-patent literature, they have a hard time finding out whether that invention already exists. And if they go ahead and issue that patent and the invention exists and somebody's demonstrated that already, now we've got a patent floating out there that might be asserted in litigation. It might be threatened in a licensing situation. A party may try to extract value out of somebody else that they don't deserve. And we've seen this escalate the cost of litigation in the area of patents, especially in the areas of software patents and business method patents in this country over the last 10 years. So four years ago, my colleague Beth Novick, uh, based on a blog that she had written previously, uh, went before a group of uh, 100 plus individuals at the patent office, including a, 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 a wide range of corporations that were interested in open source software, and proposed that rather than placing this burden solely on the examiner, what if we, we, we engaged individual citizens in this process of finding prior art? What if we ask citizen experts who know this technology and we say, what do you know about this and what do you have, what can you show that would prove that this invention already existed? She garnered support from corporations and from the PTO, from foundations, and built a software plat platform called Peer to Patent. And it became an interactive tool to engage citizen experts in the process of finding prior art. Not of examining the applications themselves. That is still the sole purview of the Patent and Trademark Office, but inviting all of us to help those examiners do a more effective job so that when they issue a patent, we should all be more confident that that patent is valid and is not claiming more than it should. I think this is probably the first proof point into what has now become much of Beth's efforts within the government, that in fact, 
people will collaborate. And Dave Kappas, the new director of the Patent and Trademark Office, has said, you don't need to convince him that collaboration works. He knows collaboration works. So as we go forward now, having gone through this pilot process with peer to patent now we're working with the Patent and Trademark Office to say, how can we make this process better and how can we implement it on a permanent basis so that we continue to have citizen experts engaging with and making our patent system more effective. I think a classic example of what we're talking about tonight. Thank you. Uh, Gigi, you work on issues such as government transparency and access to information. Uh, what needs to be done to encourage more open government, and how is the government doing today? Okay, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming here today. It's great to see some friends in the audience. I want to thank NARA, and I want to say Mrs. McGowan, I've been a telecommunications lawyer for 20 plus years, and your husband was a great man, and MCI was a great company. And quite honestly, we need another MCI to break up AT&T again, but you know, <laughs> hopefully sometime soon. And the best telecom lawyers in this town came from MCI, came from that building on 18th and H. So his legacy is very, very strong, and I'm really honored to be here. So I'm going to be a little bit of a skunk at the uh, transparency uh, party here. <laughs> and it's great, and I do believe, I agree with Beth and Mark that this administration does have a vision and a spirit and a commitment to transparency and participatory democracy, but it's not enough to talk the talk. You've got to walk the walk. And I would say that the record so far in uh, one year since the president was elected has been decidedly mixed. So I'm going to give you three examples, uh, three issues that public knowledge works on, and I would, I would divide them into the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> I'm going to spend most of the time in the ugly because the ugly is really an outrage. So the good is what's going on in the Federal Communications Commission right now under the leadership of Julius Jenikowski, uh, who I've known for about 15 years, who's the new <coughs> chairman of the FCC. Uh, under the previous leadership, the agency was about the most opaque agency one could imagine. And experts like me, it was great for me, right? Because you, know, you could have insider conversations with people that were never subject to ex parte notices and you know you could even after a decision was made but the the actual document the decision hadn't come out you could still make some changes you know in the two or three or some three weeks or sometimes a month interim between the time the decision was made and the text came out i mean it was it was really quite ugly and even though there were some things that the previous chairman did that uh, that my organization liked you felt like you wanted to take a shower afterwards and the FCC really was sort of targeted by a lot of people, not just communications lawyers like me, as, as, as being a petri dish uh, for, you know, for reform, for transparency reform, for encouraging more participatory democracy and ensuring that experts like me didn't really have all the advantages. I mean, experts like me, I work for a public interest organization. You can only imagine that the corporate lobbyists had great edge on me and the, and, and the folks that I work with. So uh, Janikowski has just done a fabulous job. Uh, he has a FCC reform list that is pages long and it includes, number one, engaging the public much more in decision making. Uh, number two, he's already had dozens of public workshops. The FCC under the economic stimulus bill that was passed in February uh, has to create a national broadband plan. Hard to believe, but this country does not have a plan for how to get universal access to high-speed broadband internet access to people. And it's hard to believe that we wasted the last 10 years uh, and never really had a plan figuring out how everybody could benefit from the internet. Well, Congress uh, finally said, FCC, you've got to do this. And he sa as I said, he's had like three dozen at least workshops and he's continuing to have workshops. Daryl talked about a proceeding that will set rules for the open internet. Net neutrality is the, is, the, is the code word. He's already planning workshops on that. So he really honestly, this is not for show, okay? He honestly wants to hear from people besides me, besides the industry lobbyists who are there 24-7. Uh, He's revamping the website. The FCC's, and this is critical, the FCC's website was built <laughs> during the Clinton era and really did not change. It is not 2.0. I mean, it is 
Zero. It's negative. <laughs> I mean, you you can't access the you can't you know there's no links to anything outside the FCC's website from the FCC. It's really quite an outrage. That's starting to change. It's going to take a massive amount of work. All the thousands and and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of documents were not machine readable. They were not searchable. So you you'd have to basically go through seven screens to find the document you want. So he's got a huge uh, amount of work ahead of him, but he's doing it, and it's, it's a really great example of somebody who wants to have, the government, to have the public participate and wants to make data available to the public. So that's the good. The bad is something I call, uh, and it's commonly known as open access publishing. So the notion there is that when the federal government pays when your taxpayer dollars are going to research on medicines, on diseases, on anything, you should get the benefit, you the taxpayer should get the benefit of that research by ensuring that, that, the, that the fruits of, that ta of those taxpayer dollars, the fruits of those research is made available online for free. Okay, so, so this obviously has been opposed by large publishers, none of whom are American companies like Reed Elsevier and Thompson, because they're afraid that it upsets their business model uh, of journals. I can quibble with that, but that's, that's not the point. Okay, the point is the taxpayers make an investment. We should have access to that for free. And so far, the only federal government agency, uh, the National Institutes of Health, does that. But they do it this way. If you get NIH money, you have to put the fruits of your research online in, in PubMed Central. It's an online archive. And you don't have to do it until 12 months afterwards. So by that time, a lot of that research, particularly if it's medical research, could be stale. Now, this administration could, by executive order, mandate that all government-funded research be made available online uh, for free. And I'm still waiting for that to happen. And I think this is something that's easy to do. It's hardly, it's controversial to two very large publishing companies. But it would be a huge benefit to the American people. So that's the bad, the ugly. The, you'll, you'll, you'll probably notice a lot of these things that I talk about involve intellectual property, intellectual property policy. And it's, it's all well and good to talk about an open internet and government transparency if you have copyright laws and patent laws that are so strong as to prevent that from happening. But that's a separate conversation. I want to talk about something that's called the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement. And I'm going to always say trade agreement because it really isn't. So what the Anti-Counterfeiting trade, trade Agreement is, it really is a multilateral intellectual property agreement <coughs> that was created by its proponents, which are large, largely large manufacturing companies, uh, the large content companies, software, Hollywood, the recording industry, uh, which, among other things, is supposed to deal with counterfeit products, enforce border enforcement, and also internet online liability issues. Okay, why am I being so vague? I'm being so vague because unless you're the lucky few you've signed a non-disclosure agreement, you can't see this agreement, all right? <clears throat> and this agreement is being called a trade agreement because the normal processes for um, determining what should be a multilateral intellectual property agreement, like the World Intellectual Property Organization, are too democratic for the proponents of ACTA. So there's a very strong civil society at WIPO. There's very strong democratic processes. It wasn't always that way, but it is now. So the proponents of ACTA said, you know what? WIPO is too democratic. Let's go to the US trade representative, and let's have a trade agreement that nobody can see. All right? So unless you're a cleared advisor, you cannot see the provisions of ACTA. So people like us are just left guessing as to what's in it. What makes matters worse is that USTR is saying, well, we're coloring within the lines of US intellectual property law, so therefore Congress does not have to look at this. We're going to do it as an executive agreement. So but how could you tell, right? Because nobody can see it. So today, my organization, along with 15 other library, 
cultural and other organizations sent a letter to President Obama saying, you have to make ACTA public. You have to make the text public. Now, there have been some people who have seen the text of ACTA. In fact, I was being a little disingenuous because I did sign a non-disclosure agreement. I've seen it. I can't tell you what the details are, otherwise I may be holed away in handcuffs. But what I can tell you is that there's absolutely nothing in there that needs to be secret. Number one and number two, I can absolutely tell you that, that, that particularly the internet provisions, I've only seen the internet provisions, do not color within the lines of US law. So I think it's critically important that this be made public. I think this is where the Obama administration has to walk the walk. And I'm hoping that they will do so very soon because this agreement is being negotiated in Korea as we speak. And it is critical to the future of online discourse, online commerce, online creativity, and a lot of stuff that we really talk about and a lot of the stuff that Beth says is so very important to this administration and I believe so. We can't have an agreement, a critical agreement like this being negotiated in secret. So I'll stop there. I think, uh, I think I've think i done my time. Well, that should get the conversation going later. I hope so. <laughs> OK. Uh, Jason, uh, you are a lawyer for the National Archives. Uh, how is the digital era affecting uh, NARA? And how, how is it affecting government record keeping in general? Well, thank you. And it's a privilege to be here. There's one thing worse than being a lawyer at the National Archives. People whisper on your back, you're a non-archivist. So uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, National Archives is a unique agency in government. We have a perspective that's sort of lateral across all government agencies and all the problems with record keeping uh, uh, government agencies have. But we also, in time, um, think back. We're about 100 yards from the rotunda where the Charters of Freedom documents are with the uh, Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Magna Carta. And those documents represent citizens of earlier ages becoming more powerful, asserting themselves, and truly shaping what a democratic <coughs> government represents. Now, we're, we also we think about those documents, we think about records, and we also think forward in time for future generations. It's a long way from the Magna Carta uh, to Facebook and Twitter. Um, uh, we can all agree to that. Uh, but the Obama administration, led by the efforts of Beth Novak and her colleagues at the White House, are really pointing the way towards an introduction of these new technologies uh, to empower citizens and um, really have them interact with us inside the Beltway types who have been here for a long time. I, I think NARA truly gets it. Um, we have committed ourselves in lots of ways to being part of this new sort of Web 2.0 world, especially in 2009, just a month ago, uh, and Beth sort of stole my thunder a little bit by talking about this, but we announced in the Office of the Federal Register that we achieved a breakthrough of sorts to basically make the Federal Register accessible and available to people by converting nine years of Federal Register text into XML format. And this change is going to really make it possible to manipulate the data in limitless ways so that you can basically personalize the data to your unique interests uh, and, and so it really is, it empowers individuals to interact with government information. Um, you can download a Federal Register and see what proposed actions might affect your community or region. And you and basically uh, can, and can do so on a very granular micro level. But we're also, at the National Archives, we're online in any number of other ways. We have a Facebook page and we have our Facebook friends. Uh, we have a blog called Narrations um, where we um, have interacted with the public to ask questions. For example, there's a question out about social tagging, um, where we're asking whether or not uh, the public at large should assist in the tagging of our archival collections uh, so as to help and aid archivists. So they're not doing the job alone with the billions of objects we have, but we actually use the wisdom of everyone, uh, the citizenry, to, to do that kind of tagging scheme. We're on YouTube. There have been 15,000 users. Uh, on our YouTube channel to watch historic videos, far more than the kind of people and foot traffic that would come to uh, a National Archives building itself. We're, of course, on Twitter. I think we have about 1,000 friends, but you know you have to start somewhere. Uh, and I don't know how many tweets we've had, but we, uh, we've, we're, we're there. And we are continuing as an institution to think about new and innovative ways to involve um, everyone in getting more access to our holdings, which are vast, I can tell you. But I also am here to say that we have enormous 
challenges um, as an agency because of this historical perspective, both looking back and looking to the future for future generations for access and transparency. The last 20 years have seen really vast changes in how government, uh, uh, the staff and agencies communicate. Um, all of our personal secretaries are gone. Um, we are replaced, they are replaced by all of us as end users being records managers in government across all agencies. And whether or not it's printing to paper, which is still the predominant paradigm in government in terms of official record schedules, or dragging and dropping um, email and word processing into electronic record keeping schemes, um, the issue for me is that we, we are still in this world of huge volumes of information coming at us, but end users having to do the job. And we just can't do it uh, by ourselves. No one has the time or energy to deal with 200 emails in an inbox a day. And so um, from my own personal view, I think NARA um, should be on the forefront. Um, what transparency means to me in government is to provide the tools uh, to do uh, truly electronic government. Everything is born digital, but still there's this transitional era we're in where it's saved in paper. And the question is, um, can we move to a world of true electronic archiving and so that uh, the, the business of government in this administration, the Obama administration, and future administrations are preserved, not just for an interaction in time now, but for uh, future generations. I'd like to think that the high-level officials in the Obama administration um, aren't spending their entire day on Twitter and Facebook, um, that they are instead, um, I know that uh, they are engaging in all sorts of important matters by sending emails, um, by um, writing memos and signing off on them, on dealing with spreadsheets, and all the business that everyone is familiar with, sort of pre-Web 2.0. They are going to have lots of opportunities to interact with the public with Web 2.0, but we want to keep our eye on the, um, the business of government in terms of record keeping and, and address all of these issues so that we can move to a world where um, uh, what is born digital really stays in digital form, at least um, that which is permanent, because the permanent stuff will be coming to the National Archives. The White House has an email archiving scheme. I think the rest of the government could have an email archiving scheme and could have other ways of really pushing out um, tools and technologies, and we would like to capture the permanent records of those agencies, uh, not just for now, but for future generations. Thank you. By the way, I love that line, that it's a long way from the Magna Carta to Twitter. I think there's a book title in, in there, right there. Uh, okay, now we're gonna move to a short free-for-all section. I'm gonna throw out a couple questions. Any of the panel can jump in. Uh, one question, what do you view as the greatest obstacles to participatory democracy? And second question, what are the concrete steps you think government should be taking to move forward on openness and transparency? Anybody can jump in. And don't all of you talk at once. I just hate that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. I think there are a couple of obstacles. One just is plain access to the, to the technology. I mean, there's 20% you know, 10% of this country has no access to high-speed broadband internet, mostly in rural areas. 20% uh, of the country doesn't have a cho only has a choice of, it's not a choice really, of, of one high-speed broadband internet provider. So there's not a lot of competition out there, and <coughs> as a result, you know, uh, prices are high, and a lot of folks can't afford to get access to the technology. Um, there are definitely challenges with getting people to adopt it. It's, it's not just price. Sometimes it's a matter of taste, or people don't know why it's important to them. Right? There's, not, there's not the content online that, that you know, uh, makes people want to desire uh, having internet access like they desire having television or cable access. So I, I, think, that's, um, I think that's probably one of, the biggest, um, one of the biggest obstacles right there. I guess I'll, I'll, uh, I'll add to that, although I want to second the importance of uh, the broadband strategy and broadband penetration to realize a participatory democracy. Um, but I'll give the other side of that, which is if we don't create the opportunities, the transparent opportunities for participation uh, in which people can engage, then they can have all the broadband that they want. We have to also create the opportunities for people to engage in government. So when the FCC did one of those remarkable broadband workshops, uh, the very first one they did was about civic engagement and civic participation, and that looked at both sides of this story. 
which is both how do we create the broadband penetration in America that allow people to get engaged, but also how do we create a culture and government across the government. And it is a very big place with very, as, as you've pointed out, divergent practices um, and entrenched culture uh, in which it is often difficult to create opportunities to create institutional opportunities for people to participate. And part of the challenge there is uh, a lack of technology in government itself. So we can you know, talk about having Twitter and Facebook, and I'm going to tweet your narrations blog later. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but it, there are a lot of agencies that don't have access to tools. And even if they do, they don't necessarily know how to use them. They don't have the experience with using them. There are policy impediments or policy ambiguities that make people wonder, is it OK for me to use some of these tools to actually engage with the American people? Um, and there are often you know, perceived legal impediments that cause people to say, I don't know if I'm allowed to be transparent or allowed to engage with people. So even if they have the tools, there may be policy impediments to doing so. And that really is ultimately a question of how do we change the culture um, and, cr and move towards uh, a participatory opportunities for engagement on both the institutional side as well as then on the side of um, individuals who are going to participate, as well as then among the interest groups and NGOs who are there in part to foster participation and engagement and who have been used to working in a very different cultural environment for so long where they have um, they have been the participants in government. They have funneled contributions from their members in order to support their lobbying activities. And now we have to think about new ways for civil society to engage um, and respond to this shift in culture towards a more participatory uh, uh, forms of engagement on the institutional side, on the civil society side, and among individuals. Mark, you were going to jump in? Well, I was just going to, you know, I think fundamental to government and politics in this country is information is power. And people are not going to give up that power readily. I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, with best experience so far in government, uh, this administration has made this an objective, but what's the pushback been, been like from the agencies in terms of we really don't want to give up this stuff. Uh, we're not really anxious to give access to everything that we've got here. What's, what's, what's that been like? I think, you know, in the first place, there are so many people who want, I mean, you know, we have so many open doors to push on first, number one. So when you have a patent office now under this administration, so talking about people like Dave Capos and his new team, who say we are 150% committed to transparency in the patent office and to making available all the patent office data. Um, but we have some technical impediments to doing so because our servers are old and we need some help with figuring out how to do that. So we're going to ask private industry to help us think about what technical strategies we, so we can't do it in one day um, because it's hard for us to do it. But, you know, if you help us, we'll get there. Um, there's so many, you know, willing innovators. You, I mean, my first week here, I came over to see folks at NARA and between the records management and modern records management and exhibitions and the Federal Register team, and the Office of the Acting Archivist, I mean, there were so many people here who were just thrilled to say, who are committed, whose work centers around transparency and collaboration and who just want to do stuff. So I don't mean to sound Pollyanna, um, but I am because I'm thrilled by all the amazing and innovative people that I've encountered. Now, when you encounter the people who say, we can't, we won't, we shouldn't, um, that's where it's awfully helpful to say, well, the president said on his first day in office that this is the vision to which we are committed, and that goes a long way. Or the ability to say, as I just did today, I called up Marvin, and I said, I've got another agency that wants to think about how they can be more open in the way that you've been in the Collaborate Project. Can you help them, share with them your know-how of what you've done? Because they're saying, eh, I don't know if we can do it because we don't know how. So it's, um, it tends to be, I haven't faced too many people who've said, we absolutely won't do this because we don't believe in it. Because we all now live in a world in which we're all living in this participatory culture of making movies and YouTube videos and whatever. We're at a right time where people, I think, all kind of get the idea that participation helps to create innovation in the economy. Um, and helps to do good things for us. So I think it's, you know, it's more a matter of I don't know how, then I won't do it um, is what I'm finding. And maybe, maybe that's me and whom I'm talking to. But um, it's a big place 
and there are so many willing innovators. So uh, I have to be relentlessly happy and optimistic, and, and uh, Gigi <laughs> has to be the skunk at the party, and we make a good team, then. It's really good. And, and she keeps me honest and keeps reminding me now I have to, whom I have to go uh, talk to and what I have to go do next. So. Yeah, I liked her metaphor that we're actually still in government 0.0. .0 so, but, uh, Jason, what's your view on this? Well, uh, I think there are a lot of obstacles, and resources is, is clearly uh, one for government agencies. But um, uh, Beth didn't ask me to do this, but I, I think government uh, SES people should all read this book. It's uh, Wiki Government, uh, and uh, and it, it's on copy, copies secretly. are available yeah. in the lobby. It's, uh, <laughs> it, it really is a, a terrific roadmap. And speaking for, on behalf of the Brookings Press, I mean they endorse this uh, idea as long as you're <laughs> buying the book, not just reading. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Uh, Why don't we just take a I, break and have a commercial? Yeah. <laughs> I, what Beth has done is each chapter has a, uh, a wonderful quote. <laughs> and the quote that I, I really like in a chapter called The Social Life of Information is, is a quote from Margaret Mead, the anthropologist. Uh, she said, uh, Margaret Mead says, uh, quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I think that in, in my lectures, so I, wor I live in a world of litigation and e-discovery and and uh, lawyers who want electronic evidence, including from the federal government. And what I uh, encounter is kind of this Rosetta Stone quality of different communities of people talking in different languages inside government. So you have legal people, you have records managed people, and then you have this IT crowd that doesn't communicate with carbon-based life forms. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and what you need is a Rosetta Stone. You need the right communities uh, of practice within agencies who can be agents of change. And in my lectures, what I say is, for at least the legal crowd, to pick somebody as the knowledge person, the agent of change, the, the knowledge council, who can really communicate across communities and, and, and get out the message of all the good um, uh, tools and techniques that are out there. And in this conversation, it would be about Web 2.0. My point when I give these lectures is I say to the legal crowd I'm with, find the youngest lawyer who has been last hired in the office because they're the ones who get it at a visceral level in terms of Web 2.0 stuff and, and, uh, and beyond. And so I would say that um, the, the fact that President Obama put out a, a memorandum on the first day of office, January 21st, about transparency and openness, shows where this administration is. And if you can push that out through OMB and through OSTP, and through all the levers of government to, to, to reach the right people in across all federal agencies, I think you can make a big difference in, in, in this first term. Okay, uh, why don't we move to the audience participation uh, part of uh, this. You've been very patient. There are microphones uh, over there as well as over here. Uh, so if you have a question or a short uh, comment, uh, we would uh, like to hear your uh, thoughts. And we would ask you to speak into the microphones because uh, this event is being broadcast. We'll start over here. Me? Okay. Hi. Um, very interesting panel. You asked the question of uh, what are the barriers, and I'd like to suggest another one, particularly since we had a lot of discussion about the Federal Register, and that is uh, the language in which the government writes. Uh, I'm one of those people that advocates for plain language, and until you can clean up the prose uh, that the government is putting out there, it, it doesn't matter how much access people have to it physically. Uh, if they can't read it, you haven't really achieved anything. And the Obama administration does periodically use the words plain language. I know Mr. Uh, Orzag has used those words and the president has used those words, but I would really like to see um, you know, if you have any suggestions about how you might move that to the next level. Jason, you want to? Well, the problem is you've got lawyers up here on the panel. <laughs> you have a whole bunch of them, right? I, I'm an anthropologist, so. Uh, so, but I, I'm in full agreement, and I think uh, that uh, uh, there really should be uh, a push uh, from uh, across government to uh, to to be more clear in what we're saying, because it really it makes no sense to to put out products in the 21st century that people can't uh, engage with and read. You know, I've been uh, doing a little bit of research because we have this FCC reform project, and I think the FCC's website is probably an example, of, uh, the worst example <laughs> of jargon and, you know, technical terms. Hopefully, again, that will change. But we were looking for sort of best practices, and I think the EPA's website is a really excellent 
uh, example of play language, simple to understand concepts, and actual real visuals. I mean, the FCC's website, uh, other than the pictures of the, of the commissioners, it doesn't have one video on it or one picture. It is about as static as you can get. So, you know, EPA, I think, is a real great example of, of, of an engaging website. Now, granted, it's probably easier to explain environmental issues than it is to explain telecommunications issues, but still, there's, a, there's just a huge gulf. I'll tell you one thing, though, that's, um, I think, very encouraging, and we are focused on what we can do in this area and really trying, with the downloadable Federal Register and this ability now to m make it work in different ways, I mean, it really allows us to try some new things. Um, but one of the main things, I think, is when we start to think about how we open up government and we do things like come in and say, we're going to create an open government policy and we're going to talk to Americans about how to do that before we write the policy, not afterwards. Or Arne Duncan comes into the Department of Education and says, we need to reauthorize No Child Left Behind next year. We're going to talk to Americans before we write up our draft, not afterwards. By changing the process, it changes the nature of the language that we need to use. Um, because we have to talk in more plain and direct ways that allow us to do that engagement. When we have government processes that focus on, I'm going to write a draft of a rule, or I'm going to write a draft of a policy in its you know, uh, legalistic form, and then you ask people for comment, of course they can't read it and can't understand it. And we frankly, it's part of the kind of legal, you know, conspiracy of the legal priesthood that we don't want people to understand it or to give us comments because we've already spent all this time writing the draft, so we surely don't want to rewrite it at that <laughs> point. So what it allows us to do is when we change to more open processes of decision making and we push forward the opportunity for participation earlier in the process, then that hopefully creates um, a change to the way that we draft the language, the way that we communicate with people around issues um, towards a simpler and easier way of talking and a more visual sometimes way of talking as well. Okay, we'll take a question over here. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm just a quick comment. I'm thinking that um, the archives and the systems that you're creating and the new websites probably also help burgeoning democracies around the world figure out their systems and maybe learn from our mistakes and, and develop some systems. So that's just a side comment because we do um, care about that. A um, couple of quick questions. One is formats change. So when you're talking about archiving and patents, et cetera, how do you address that obstacle? I mean, we don't use Betamax anymore as the obvious example. <laughs> So how do you address that? And the other is, people have an investment in technologies, et cetera. I mean, how do you get people to create these technologies if they're not going to be compensated for them? If they're all open, if they're open source, then why should they bother if they're not going to get anything for it? I, I could take the first question. I'll leave to the second for my colleagues. Um, first question is about uh, migration and, and formatting. And we at the National Archives, we, we don't want to be a Smithsonian of every proprietary format that has ever existed. Uh, uh, and so we have, uh, this is a huge challenge for us, but we have a major project called the Electronic Records Archives. And one of the premises of that is to take any kind of proprietary object that the government creates, and if it's a permanent record, bring it in, and we basically do an XML metadata wrap or something equivalent of that uh, to make sure that that proprietary structure is intact, has integrity, and can be read somewhat, you know, somewhere over time and generations to come. And it's really important, I can speak from a lawyer who deals with litigation, very important that we make sure that the chain of custody is there for uh, bringing in and ingesting electronic objects and making sure that they remain authentic uh, uh, for, for really for decades and, and beyond. So it's a really important question. You should go to our website. Uh, we have lots of good material on electronic records archives that, uh, that at least goes a long way towards answering those kind of concerns. Mark, you want to answer the question on incentives for open source? Well, ha having worked for a company that is now worth about $5 billion and is, uh, gives its software away for free, um, you can make money off of open source. Um, the, the great, I call it the great myth of open source is that you have tens of thousands of software programmers out in the world writing this code for free. 
uh, not true. Most of them work for companies. And the companies have decided that it's in their self-interest to share that software code with other companies, that they all advance together and make progress. And it re really brings us back to two things that tie, and tie back in uh, to this discussion. One is open formats, assuring that documents will continue to be available in formats that are accessible to all of us and that will not change at the whim of a single company. Uh, the other is open specifications, that as we start to build these systems, that we do so on a basis that all of us understand what the rules of the road are going to be, and we can all access the data on an even, uh, even basis with everyone else. Those are two challenging uh, aspects for us because we've become very reliant on technology that has come to us from a fairly narrow band of companies that have been very focused on retaining their customers and doing so at least in one way by using proprietary data formats. The other thing I would add is let's not forget that digital is not permanent. Uh, paper, we know how long paper lasts. In fact, we've been astounded by how, at times, by how long paper lasts. What we don't know today is how long digital lasts. How long will those digital records be maintained on those disk drives before the disk drive fails, before it becomes corrupted simply through age, and the next thing we know, we've lost the content. How many of us have put photos on DVDs thinking we have created a permanent archive of our photographs? <laughs> Not true. And so those kind of challenges still sit out there for us, especially as we continue to make all this data more accessible in a digital manner. Okay, a question over here. I, um, I've noticed that one of the barriers that I have seen in government to implementing some of these Web 2.0 technologies has been the need to maintain private information as private. And I was wondering what your opinions are on how exactly we navigate the challenge of trying to expand the information that we can provide to people in a way that they can customize for themselves while we're still maintaining the privacy of the citizens and not collecting personal, personally identifiable information. Panelists? I think you have, to, you have to give people control over their own data. You have to, at a minimum, <coughs> let them know what you're collecting and, and give them the option to opt out. At a minimum, I mean, you know, others believe you should, they should have to opt in. But, uh, you know, I think this is more of a problem in the commercial realm than it is in the government realm, although I think increasingly as we go to government 2.0, it's going to be a problem. But, I, you know, I just think absolutely uh, as a matter of right, a person has got to be able to see and change the data that you've collected on them. But it's interesting because, I mean, you know, my organization is very much a Web 2.0 organization. We're like public knowledge, sharing of information, but we, f we find ourselves increasingly coming up against, you know, some of the privacy advocates uh, because, it, you know, obviously the sharing of information and, and wanting things to be kept private are going to clash. And I think you're going to see it increasingly in policy realm clashing as well and, and figuring out what the best practices are I think it's something that really needs to be done now. I'll just add that I think, uh, you know, part of uh, privacy is part of open government, and so for that reason, when the CIO Council launched data.gov, um, and when they continue now to agencies to put up data feeds on data.gov, that data is very carefully scrutinized for personally identifiable information. When the White House releases the visitor records, uh, as it began to do on Friday. Uh, one of the reasons there was a lag between the announcement and the release of the records was in order to make sure that social security numbers and other personally identifiable information wasn't, wasn't included. So it's a, being transparent has to be also respectful of the value of privacy, and it means it's another reason that instant transparency isn't always doable and possible. It's another reason why I think that the development of the creation of apps.gov 
this new website that GSA offers at some level, what GSA does is they create a searchable catalog of products that agencies can acquire. But where that's really important in the software realm is that they're pre-vetting tools to ensure that their uh, terms of service are privacy friendly and respect uh, personally identifiable information so that when an agency says, I want to select a Web 2.0 tool, we're not doing a free-for-all of choosing any old product, but making sure that we're complying with and respectful of privacy as we move towards a more Web 2.0 environment. So some of those um, coordinating steps are actually, I think, very helpful to ensuring that we do both of these. But I agree with Gigi that it's uh, figuring out the best practices as we move into this wild and woolly new world is, uh, is um, a difficult job. OK, next question over here. Um, great panel. Um, moving to towards Web 2.0 and utilizing the internet puts a great dependency on the, these telecom companies. And I've noticed that um, you know, the recent discussions about net neutrality and all these things, they're kind of butting heads with the government. And I just want to know, what is the strategy to ensure that these private companies, these telecom companies, are in the best interest of the government? Well, I can talk about net neutrality generally and why I think it's in the best interest of the American people and, and the best interest of the government as well. Basically, in this country, for the most part, you have a series of regional duopolies, telephone companies and cable companies that control access to the internet. Okay? They are not the internet. People say, oh, net neutrality, you're regulating the internet. No. Okay? <laughs> net neutrality is about regulating and ensuring fairness uh, among the on-ramps to the internet in a way that telecom companies have been regulated for 100 years. Right, so people, oh, this is new. No, it's not new, all right? So when you had your landline telephone, your telephone company couldn't decide that Mark's phone calls got higher quality than my phone calls. And this is what net neutrality is about. It makes sure that the cable company and the telephone company can't pick winners and losers, can't decide that you know Google's search engine and website comes up with no jitter, but you know, Yahoo's sorry about that. And, and you know, if you want your website to come up with no jitter, then you better pay us X amount of money. Uh, that doesn't mean that Yahoo and Google don't pay the telcos you know, for all the lines and all the servers they need. They pay them millions and maybe billions of dollars. But the idea is you don't want the internet to turn into your cable system, right? Everybody loves your cable company, right? So, right? So the, the cable company decides, with the exception of broadcast channels, what, cha what networks get on their system, what channel position they get, whether they get on the digital tier or not, you have absolutely no control. The internet is the most democratic medium we've ever had. You, and, and the way the internet, and Mike Nelson is going to ask the next question, is even a better person to talk about this than, than I am, but the internet was created so the control would be at the ends. Not that there would be some gatekeeper determining you know, who gets what quality of service and who gets what speeds and whose you know, website comes up faster than others. So that's what network neutrality is about. Now, people want to say, well, why shouldn't network neutrality apply to Google? Google's not a network. Right? If we want to have a conversation about whether you know, Google search is, is neutral, that's a different conversation. But right now, we're talking about who controls the on-ramps to the internet, and should they be able to pick winners and losers? And I think they should not, and that's best both for the government and for the American people. Uh, Mike Nelson, we hope you didn't come here to be anonymous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> luckily not. Thanks for the introduction, Gigi, but I'm actually going to ask a question of Beth and Jason. I, I wanted to go a little deeper into this question of where transparency runs into privacy, and particularly look at examples from the Web 2.0 world and particularly look at the question of privacy for government officials. Uh, just a couple of illustrations. When I worked at the White House 15 years ago, I, I knew that my email could end up in the National Archives. The people who sent me email didn't necessarily know that. And they included close personal friends who were sometimes sharing close personal information. We had a case where several of the top appointees from the Obama administration got appointed, and within 30 seconds, their Facebook page disappeared because they didn't want anybody reading their Facebook page and using that information against them on the Hill. We had a case where Sarah Palin was using her personal email account 
to do political and policy work. The archivist would probably say, that material should be saved so we understand the policy process. She would say, well, I was talking to my friends. How do we work that problem? How do, and particularly when we have this situation with Facebook where the government official might have to share something under legal obligation, but that also would involve sharing information about people who have sent information to them without expecting that information to be in the archives or in the Washington Post or in the historical record. So how do we really work this problem about privacy in an interconnected, shared world? That's a great question because, you know, I tried to befriend Larry Summers and he still has not replied to me and I'm not <laughs> about this. I'll be your friend, Daryl. <laughs> well, let me take a, a partial swing at that um, because there's a great social experiment that has been going on at the White House since 1994. There was a case that I had some association with called Armstrong versus Executive Office of the President. And as a result of the decisions in that case that email was considered to be a government record and, and to be preserved, uh, the White House put into place, the Clinton White House put into place an email archiving system that more or less has been in place uh, from the Clinton years to the Bush years and now in the Obama years in various, uh, in various uh, platforms. And uh, just like sort of a reality TV uh, show, even though when you sign on every morning at the White House and there's a banner that says this is US government property and that there's some archiving scheme, I think people forget. And there's, there are 32 million emails from the Clinton years that have now been preserved, presidential and federal, some of yours, and um, <laughs> perhaps, and uh, 200 plus million from the Bush years. And I'm out there predicting in a law review that we'll have a billion emails from uh, the end if there are two terms of the Obama administration or whatever the next uh, president inbox, is. Um, and, uh, and that's all, just Beth, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the fact is, and there may be, and beyond email, because, uh, uh, because you know, email may be uh, uh, something that there's a tipping point and it's a messaging or whatever. And the, the fact is, is that all of this collection is there. Um, so um, the responsibility as a government lawyer and as an official for what has been sent into the White House and what has been generated by White House staff. Um, when there's a FOIA, and the Presidential Records Act incorporates the FOIA, and so that five years after office there is the availability of FOIA request to White House email, um, the, the responsibility is really on myself and my colleagues and those that work on these matters to do the right thing, which is to protect the privacy uh, interests that are at stake. Uh, so when I vetted um, Chief Justice Roberts's email when he was a young lawyer at the Reagan administration a few years back when it part of the nomination and said in Leahy wanted us to do a huge production right away. We went through and we looked to see whether there are third parties that he may have, he may have worked on matters about individuals being vetted and they might have had some history or something that we would redact um, out. And there are tools and technologies that uh, allow for that. Um, so uh, I think it's very important. We have uh, in the audience here the director of the new office at the National Archives, the Office of Government Information Services, and Miriam Nisbet is very much on the forefront of thinking about these issues uh, from a FOIA perspective uh, to ensure that Exemption 6 and privacy rights are protected. So that's a partial answer to the question. But I'm going to defer on the Facebook aspect of that uh, to uh, my colleague, Ms. Novak. <laughs> The, the, uh, uh, I was going to say that this is Daryl's 17th book now. I think it's a wonderful <laughs> question, or maybe it's uh, your next Law Review article uh, that you'll work on, because I think you've raised a whole host of questions in asking this. One has to do with the First Amendment rights of government employees um, to speak, and to speak also using social media. And so I think we want to encourage netizenship, if that's uh, a, a fair word, among government employees to be out there, to be engaged, and to do so um, and that raises a lot of tricky questions. I mean, it's tricky questions that are raised in any organization about how one, with what voice one speaks, um, and what the, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's an issue of, you know, developing best practices around what's appropriate and not appropriate. I happen to know of a government official who took down a Facebook page, um, not out of a lack of transparency, but because this person's uh, children were receiving death threats. And so the um, material on the Facebook page was creating fodder for, um, you know, the person was in a new public, uh, a high profile public role. Um, and so they took down the Facebook page to again have a segregation of, in some ways, between their private life, which had suddenly become 
um, very public in ways that were uh, that were uncomfortable and inappropriate. So I think there's there's a set of issues first about creating the environment in which government officials will speak and will be netizens and will participate and use social media. I think there's a second issue about you know on my own inbox I have an email address that has an autoresponder on it which says when you send me an email that the, what you send me may be posted or made publicly available. Um, for precisely this reason, and so is to create that alert for people. And we are under strict instructions that you know if you want to talk about trading recipes and what you had for breakfast, and um, my government account is not the place to do those conversations, but to keep those personal and private conversations separate. But this is increasingly difficult, as you point out, particularly when um, it may be easier or faster for us to use other accounts and what and how we do this. So I think to some extent, technology will provide um, some help for us, some of the natural language processing tools. Um, but it's the policies that people like Miriam and uh, uh, um, others are working on um, that will help us to figure out how we navigate these waters. But again, I think that it's, it's, it's not something where we can just put up our hands in despair and go, oh, it's such a big problem, what are you going to do? We have to just develop the best practice and move forward, informed by the values of a commitment to free speech, including for government employees and government officials, a desire to speak out and engage more with people, and a recognition that the conversations that we're having focus around issues of public import and around policy, which means there's a decreased expectation of privacy about the communications we have in our role as government officials. But I look forward to the book. Okay, next question. Yeah, I'd like to thank the panel for a very well-informed and high-level uh, discussion, but uh, I can't help being struck by the, um, what I would uh, call uh, American exceptionalism of the discussion and uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the internet is inherently global uh, and the neurons and synapses of the World Wide Web have uh, shrunk the, uh, the global village and uh, uh, been driving the globalization trend for the last 20 years. And so uh, we don't, we aren't operating in a vacuum. And, uh, you know, we, we are really both informing and drawing from uh, other countries and the rest of the world uh, in everything we do. And so, uh, but there hasn't been any discussion or mention of what that relationship is and how we are managing it and what what our expectations are with regard to the rest of the world in uh, information policy and information um, uh, uh, activities. Uh, you know, the, this, the US government uh, is probably the most transparent, uh, uh, despite the bad and the ugly. Uh, and uh, uh, and that's, that's kind of a sad state of affairs if you think about the, you know, the rest of the world. But uh, we have a lot we have a lot to uh, show by way of leadership or uh, demonstrating the, the benefits of openness uh, on the online uh, from uh, the public domain and government information and, and from the, the, uh, the, the various benefits that accrue from an open information policy uh, okay, to so other countries. Okay, so can we get countries. your question here? Yes, yes. So the question <laughs> is, uh, what is the Obama administration in particular uh, doing with regard to uh, managing this on an international basis uh, and uh, both trying to influence other governments so that there's less of an asymmetry in, in information policy as well as learning from other uh, contexts for our own uh, policy development? Uh, I won't speak for the, the administration, but just giving as an example the peer-to-patent program that we've had in operation with, with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. From that, we've had spin-off uh, pilots uh, in development with the U.K. Uh, Japan has run in their own pilot, is now looking to integrate that into the same technology base that we, we've been using. Australia and other patent offices around the world have inquired about this. And it makes a lot of sense because so many patent applications are filed on, on a PCT basis, which means that I file, for example, as a US citizen, I may file my patent application in the US, but I also file so that I'm claiming patent rights in many other countries at the same time because patent rights are protected country by country. 
well, it doesn't make sense to have every country have to do the same search for prior art over and over and over again. It's just not efficient. So if we've got this group of citizen experts, why not ask them to look once for everybody? And in the US pilot, it was not open just to citizen experts in the US, but in fact, citizen experts throughout the world the second largest national group that we had participating was India. Uh, we had uh, a fellow in the Czech Republic identify a piece of non-patent literature that knocked out the claims of a key patent of one of our technology companies, and it was based on some Eastern European publication. We would have never found that, but it existed. Somebody had already invented the invention. Um, so it's been fascinating to watch that process. And it's not one that we've had to drive necessarily by intent, although programmatically at New York Law School, we've wanted to extend the technology internationally. Uh, but what we found is people are watching us and watching what we are doing right now and saying, we want to replicate that. Uh, and so some of it's just, uh, um, following the, the lead that we provided, and then making ourselves accessible to them. OK, I think we have time just for one uh, last uh, question. We're almost out of time here. OK, I'd, I'd like to, first of all, echo the compliments to the panel on a very fascinating and informative evening. Um, also to reassure Jason as an IT guy that uh, some of us actually can interact with carbon-based life forms. Uh, as, as, as I've been specializing in security the for the past 10 oh. years, that's become more and more of the uh, challenge. And uh, I hope from that perspective, I'm not going to bring another skunk to the party. But uh, when uh, Beth uh, mentioned that uh, the trust in the American people to collaborate with government uh, the thought that went through my mind was whether that, or the question was whether that trust might be well-founded or not. Because the reality is that we have an internet where 80 to 90 percent of all email is spam. Most of it is carrying malicious content. Uh, we have a situation where there's a lot of fraud online. Uh, we have, we have live in a world where Everyone isn't dedicated to making things work together. You're all lawyers. You're familiar with the fact that there's a lot of adversarial positioning that people engage in. With all of this as a backdrop, the question is, what areas are in critical need of improvement to, for us to realize the potential for this per improvement in participatory democracy and to keep it from getting mired down into the same kind of problems that we've seen in other areas and on the internet up to this point. Good closing question, panelists. Uh, I'll, I guess I'll start on this one. Um, so obviously the security of our network infrastructure is a precondition to the same point about sort of broadband access. We have to have uh, access to networks that are actually secure in order to, as a baseline in order to enable us to have a participatory culture. One of the exciting things though now I think is the development of new kinds of social media. The talk of this panel is very much about Web 2.0 that allow us to ensure that even when we have um, things like uh, you know, whether the participation is malicious or the participation is spam or the participation is just intentionally kind of troublemaking for the fun of it, that we now have tools that allow us to do things, for example, like with natural language processing tools. University of Massachusetts just announced their new system last week for um, analyzing comments to agencies and uh, identifying that out of 500,000 duplicative comments, you know, 400,000 may be the same because they're all just done by a bot. <laughs> And then we can, you know, we can say, oh, these 400,000 are the same, and therefore we only have to read 100,000 or more likely 10,000 in the pile of the 500,000. So we have some tools that allow us to do this. We have new social media rating and ranking collaborative filtering tools that allow us to um, rate and rank suggestions up and down, to tag suggestions and to tag comments so that we can sort them more effectively. So even when people are not maliciously participating, but there's just a huge volume of participation, we have a way to manage that content. And where people are kind of just having fun or being silly and being off topic, whether for um, malicious reasons or otherwise, we have the ability for communities of people to self-moderate their participation 
so that we can actually ensure that, it, that the conversation stays on topic. Um, when, I f when we first started our open government public consultation, it was well known in the first day or two, in fact, this was a project that was run um, by the National Academy of Public Administration in collaboration with us. Um, we got a lot of initial postings that were either about UFOs um, or about the president's birth certificate or the president's birth certificate being on a UFO. Um, <laughs> and so I earned the title in my office. There's a sign on my door which says Director of Intergalactic Policy is my title, but what happened after the first day, which was widely reported on, was then those social media tools kicked in and allowed us to do some of that. The community itself, um, who were in the open government community that said, we are stakeholders of this conversation and we are going to take charge of ensuring and using the tools that are available to us to rate and rank and flagging things as off topic, to actually make sure that the conversation is well moderated all those people went away, um, and it caused the conversation itself to stay on topic of its own accord. So I think that there's some, yes, basic issues about infrastructure that we have to deal with, and particularly in issues of critical infrastructure around, um, you know, whether it's national security or financial services. But when it comes to things like the social practices of participation, we have a lot of new tools available to us as well from the front, front end, if you will, as well as from the back end that are helping us to do these things better and more effectively, but we are really just at you know 0 0.1 of having the tools available. And the last thing I'll just say with regard to this is, as we begin as government, which is a very big consumer of technology, buying $76 billion of technology a year, as we begin to articulate the demand for better citizen engagement platforms, I think the IT industry will also step up to create those platforms for us. It just hasn't been a demand for them before. Um, and I think we're going to see now the development of better IT tools that allow us to create a more participatory culture. Okay, I think we will make that the benediction on this panel, but I want to thank uh, Beth, uh, Jason, Gigi, and Mark, and I also want to thank you, the audience. You asked terrific questions, and we appreciate your coming out tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.